please give a warm welcome to uh, co-writer, director, Fernanda Valadez. Welcome, welcome, Fernanda. Um, right off the bat, I wanted to ask you about um, the decision to have the film in five episodes, and I greatly admire that each episode has a different visual um, way of telling each episode. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, welcome also um, the producer of the film, Yuval Ross, and, and I'm very happy that he's here. <laughs> welcome. And I think for Astrid and myself, because we are two directors, Astrid Rondero and, and me, Fernanda, one of the aspects that was more exciting for us was dividing the film into episodes, because that gave us the chance to treat these different stages of the boy uh, as a season. And so we could do um, not necessarily different, different genres, but different styles. So we could uh, imprint these um, stages of his growth. And uh, well, that's uh, what we tried to do. And, um, you know, tell us about the aspect that there is this it's it's grounded in realism but you there are this beautiful lyrical aspect to the film um in particular the the um the section with namasian yeah the sort of magical mysterious aspect to that to this well in 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 this exploration of doing different episodes uh, we wanted to treat reality or, or to try to express that reality. It's not necessarily the only, the physical stuff that we are surrounded with. And to come from this very violent uh, episode with the father, the father being killed, and then um, taking the child to the world of the aunt uh, and, and to treat that through uh, the innocence and the wonder of his eyes. So we could um, see how um, the spirituality of the ant informs his personality. So everything he feels and, and sees this amazement um, to, to nature, to animals, to everything that is beyond human, and also to death, uh, to the relationship to the death of the father is being through that uh, perspective. I have two follow-up questions to, to the, what you just said, but the first one is the relationship to nature and animals. One passage that, that took my breath away is where Nemesia and Suha are walking late at night and there is a wild dog that attacks well, he thinks he attacks him, and then um, the Messiah says, that's just, you know, a wild animal. Um, you know, can you tell us the, the genesis of that scene that is breathtaking? I think uh, for us and myself, because we have dealt with stories about violence for, for um, quite some years now, one of the aspects that really shocks us and surprises us is that whenever all this really brutal stuff happens in the rural areas in Mexico, there's also this amazing beauty. And that irony, uh, it's something we wanted to express because we are struggling every day in those places. And at the same time, nature, it's happening and it's independent of our struggles. And, and we wanted to talk also about that. Mm -hmm. And then there's two passages where death happens, where you, the way you portray it is, it, you know, a slow motion, the character is in nature and it's just passing by. And we know that death happened. Um, you, know, you know, tell us about those, those two moments 
I think when, when we were rewriting the script and when we were thinking how are we going to express uh, this, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say exactly a visitation or, or this um, relationship uh, of Nemesia with, with death, um, we wanted to, to, to let the audience feel uh, the absence and, and, and also uh, this relationship with nature in which it's not only literal, but it's um, kind of a, a passage and an understanding mm -hmm. uh, of, of how violence um, impacts emotionally a character mm -hmm. Uh, in a situation, so to, to, to be honest, we shot different, the scene in different ways. And when we tried uh, that with the slow motion, we, we knew it was the, the right one, so we, we went from there. But always, um, the way you tell the story, lighting, the, the cinematography is so essential to the film. Um, I was struck by the natural lighting that you did, the available lighting. Um, I, whenever I think about your film, I think about the moon sequences that were so stunning, and then during the day is bright. You know, we see the sunlight. It's, it's, tell us about the importance of shooting in natural lighting. I think that was one of the challenges. Um, in, in, in terms of style, uh, I'm usually annoyed when I see a film uh, supposedly shot in nature and I see uh, the origin of the lights, like the electrical lights. Mm -hmm. when, when you are seeing a night scene and, and I can see, uh, okay, there's an HMI and, and there's a LED light and there's that, that, that annoys me. So I think the challenge was to integrate the lightning uh, in, into this uh, nature, into the ambience, and, and like, like we, we were talking just a few minutes ago, to give each um, part kind of uh, a different feeling, a, a different uh, atmosphere. So uh, what we did in the end was to make a production schedule according to the cycles of the moon, so we could really shot with a full moonlight and just to reinforce uh, with practicals and with very specific lights to not to disturb that, that sensation. Mm -hmm. And well, that was, that was a challenge, but I think it was a, a lot of fun. And, and it was also an exercise of patience uh, because we could only shoot when the moon was really high and then uh, we only had like uh, four to five hours a night. Wow. Um I, I want to ask you about the horse sequences in the beginning and at the end that, you know, it is the young Josue that sees the horse and the impact of the horse on him and, and the horse is named Suho and the, him passing down to his son the name Suho and, and pardon me if I if I misinterpret what you mean by, by, by that, but what struck me is that men pass on inheritance to their sons. And in this particular case, you have this very violent man that, that has a child. And the, 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 the imprint of inheritance from inheritance to inheritance, am I on the wrong path? No, no, I think that's, for us, that's the essence of the film. I, th I think it's the first sensation that came to us, and we built the, f the film from there, from the beginning and, and, and the ending. And I think it has to do with what we have experiencing in Mexico. We've been having this crisis of violence. Uh, we couldn't even call it a crisis anymore because it has been going on for over 20 years. And there's this whole generation of children born in, into this uh, whirlwind of, 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 of murder and, and blood. But at the same time, we wanted to talk about uh, of possible routes of 
escape, and escape is not even the word, of um, dealing with that and doing something else. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the image and the situation that moved us is thinking about this father, this perpetrator, a violent man, who at the same time loves his kid, is a loving father, so he inherits, uh, Suho inherits this double, um, this double inheritance, of violence and love. And in the end, this perpetrator was once a kid, marveled by the beauty of a horse. And when he names his son, that's when, what, what he's thinking mm -hmm. about. So Suho, in reality, what inherits his true inheritance is the possibility of love. And, uh, well, I think that's what we wanted to talk about. Um, which leads me to a question that I wanted to ask you, is that, I, that when you portray Josue, it's so complex. You have, you know, we see him be incredibly violent at the beginning, and he's a traitor, um, a Sicario traitor, but then you focus on moments where he's so gentle to little Suho. And, you know, tell us about the complexity, portraying the, the complexity of, of Josue. That was one of the greatest challenges. Uh, I think, for the most part in film, we are used to divide. Uh, the characters between the good and the bad, the victims and the perpetrators. But in, in reality, um, we are not like that. We are much more complex and we can be the two of them and we can transit between a victim and a perpetrator depending on, on the context and the situation. And um, that's what we wanted to, to do with Josue. We see him killing a guy and then we see him teaching his boy how to open the door of the car so he doesn't get locked again. Um, and, and I mean, we are like that. And in and, and the specifics of Mexico, I, I think we have a generation of young men very vulnerable to being recruited or to be, to be pulled by violence and, and to transit between these two realities. Um, I, I want to, to recognize, to give recognition, there's this one great author in Mexico called Javier Valdez. He was killed in 2017. And I think he was probably the first one who could tell the stories of these kids and to tell them in a way that allowed you to understand that these kids who became uh, criminals were at the same time just mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. We'll go back to the themes, but uh, when I introduce the film, and one of the things that I find so compelling about your film is that it has this almost novelistic quality. It feels like a novel. It feels very timeless. Um, kind of like Dickens, you have this orphan against all these trials and tribulations, and you have the chapters, etc. Um, you know, tell us about approaching the story in a sort of novel literature aspect. And uh, am I wrong to? No, no. Um, well, um, in the way Astrid and I work, one of us comes with an idea and then writes the first draft, and then the other one reads and, and comments and then makes another pass. And it was Astrid the one who came with idea and, and with uh, this uh, first uh, draft of this universe. And I think she was thinking, there's this particular book that she loves called Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy, yeah. Uh, uh, it was written just uh, almost at the beginning of, of the 20th century. And that book is um, a rumination. It's also um, the protagonist is an orphan. And it's a rumination on uh, destiny and freedom, and I think that was the inspiration in terms of uh, how to tackle. And I think for the both of us, using the figure of an orphan in the context of a crisis allows you to feel 
not only to think, but, but to feel this crisis uh, through the eyes of an innocent, innocent child. So I think that's why we decided to use the chapters and, and having that in mind, using l l literature as an inspiration. Um, the two of you have, done, have worked before, you're co-director, co-writer, but, and I'm a big fan of your previous film, Identifying Figures, but this is the first time that m the, a male character is at the center. You have done, for point of view, from women. You know, tell us about this shift to a male point of view. Well, when, when we were preparing Identifying Features, which tells the story of a mother looking for a, a, a missing son that, that disappears on the way to the border with, between Mexico and the US, we went to Guanajuato, which is the, the state I come from. Uh, and we had a chance for the first time to talk to young men and young kids uh, who were similar um, to, to the characters we, we were writing about in identifying features. But then we found something else. We, find, we found uh, this 12, 13, 14 year olds that already had the experience of trying to cross the border with the United States. Some of them were, uh, were already, had already been deported. Some of them uh, were migrating to the big cities in Mexico. And some others were at this very young age beginning to be seduced by the local cartels. So I think that experience, this very raw and real experience of talking to those boys uh, inspired us to, to tell this story mm -hmm. and, and made us understand that uh, in, in the very dangerous country that is Mexico, boys were really vulnerable to recruitment because the way they were uh, raised because their masculinity was being built. So that's the focus we, we, we tried to give to the film. Mm -hmm. we, we felt as women, we, we tried to understand that this masculinity. And I think the only way in which we could do it was through the eyes of women, mm -hmm. like, like Demencia. Demencia and Rosalia and, and the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I, I, I'm sorry. I, no, I, no, 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 no. I have to say that in Mexico, it, it's not only in, in our imagination, but in many of those communities, women um, who are left behind because many of, of the husbands and the sons and the fathers try to, to come to this country are the ones making the resistance against violence. And, and we also want to, to make a statement about that. Well, that, that comes across in the story that the powerful characters are the, the women, which I want to ask you about the contrast between the teacher and the Messia. And the Messia is this mother uh, earth kind of character, very earthy, very mystical. And then opposing, you have another uh, very instrumental woman, but she is intellect. You know, she's wise, but from an academic point of view. Was that intentional to have the two opposing worlds be the 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 words the, you know the 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 wiser characters in the movie? Yes, we we wanted to talk about education, of course, in in the academical sense of the world, uh, and and that's what Susan does for for Suho to to allow him or to. Uh, invite him and in, in helping him to transit into this uh, into this world to, to, to give him a chance to to, to be an ed educated man. But I think deep, deep down it was more important to us to talk about the ways in which a person is spiritually formed, and that's Nemesia for Suho. She is the possibility uh, that. Uh, th the character that allows him to be a different kind of man. And, mm -hmm. and we wanted to, to talk about that through uh, her. I'm assuming you shot in 
you know, in, in available sets, but the Nemesia house to me visually is just stunning. Is that a house that you found and then you, you, you retrofitted it, et cetera, for filming? It's a gorgeous set, the Nemesia house. We, we built it and um, in, in, since our previous film, and we had the chance to work with local constructors so we uh, designed the house with our cinematographer and our production designer with the help of, of, of the local constructor so it would feel and it would have the style of, of, of the area with uh, real materials, but also uh, giving us the chance to design the windows and, and the entrances of light uh, so we could film both uh, during the morning and the evening uh, depending on the movement of of, of the sun, and, and and it allowed us to just design the scenes uh, in the way we, we we felt we we needed. Um, I'm curious about the editing. I I greatly admire how how much time you devoted to each chapter. Was that something that was trial and error, or it was always in the script? How much time you sp you you spend? with Suho when he was very, very young, when he was a teenager, et cetera? Well, uh, I think we had two challenges in the writing. First, we had a, a long script. Um, then we had to reduce it in the writing. But then, of course, we had a long film. Uh, when we had the first cut, it was around three hours. And of course, we knew we had to, to cut it down. Uh, the way we, we work, and, and I'm going to talk about Jewel uh, in, in, in a minute because he was really important. I Generally, I do the first couple of drafts. My rhythm, it's slower than Astrid. Astrid is like really, uh, her personality, she's more funny and, 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 and she goes right to the point. So then we work with uh, a co-editor, Susan Corda, uh, she's based in New York, who helps us negotiate between the two of us and also find, I mean, not the two of us, but to find the right rhythm of, of the film. And we did have to change and move around some scenes um, in the middle part just to adjust the rhythm. And, and Jewel, he was really important in helping us find, uh, I think, the energy and, and also the right amount of information between the beginning and, and, and the ending. So, no, the, the editing, I think it's, it's, it's really important. It's really strong. Um, and then tell us about working with the actors. You have actors that never worked in cinema before, and then you have, you know, um, you know the, uh, the teacher, and then you have Namastia that are actresses, you know, tell us about that dynamic of, of working with the two different groups. Well, uh, Juan Jesus Varela, the young man um, that plays Sujo, he acted in a previous film. When we met him, he was 14, um, 15 when we produced the film. And I think he really found his calling in acting. And, and that's something um, that we also wanted to talk about in Suho because when we casted him in, in a community, in a rural community, uh, what we felt is was, had he born in another reality, we would have found him uh, in a film school or a theater school or an actor's workshop. And I think Juan Jesus, we cannot call him a non-professional actor anymore because he has been um, casting for films and short films. Uh, and, and he was really committed uh, with Suho. We, we made a deal with him that he needed to finish high school uh, so we could cast him for, for this role. And, and he was really disciplined and committed. And um, so we, we built the rest of the cast around him with two professional actresses, uh, Yadira Perez, who plays Nemesia, and Carla Garrido, who plays Rosalia, who were very important for us to direct the little children who um, 
whom we cast in, in the community. I, I want to ask you about the, the masculinity. I mean, the whole film dissects masculinity, but then in particular, the boxing, you know, the, when he walks by the boxing area and they're calling him names and ultimately he goes in and, and fights them. You know, um, I'd love to hear your, your, your take on deconstructing masculinity in your film. I think um, probably everywhere, but particularly in Mexico, kids are pushed um, to, to prove themselves as tough and aggressive. Uh, and, and I think um, we wanted, of course, to, to talk about that. And we wanted to talk about this natural process of becoming an adult, of passing through the teenagers' years, uh, which is always dangerous, but it's more dangerous in the context of the cartels. Because the cartels are always using this very natural energy of trying to prove yourself in front of your peers to use you, to use these young kids. Uh, so uh, throughout the film, w we wanted to put uh, scenes that talked about that, like uh, uh, the scene about the tattoos on the chest. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then it finally ends up like it, with, with a boxing match when you find out that Suho already has a, a tattoo. And we wanted to hold that information until that point in the film because we felt that if we revealed it too early, perhaps the prejudice of the audience would be too great uh, mm -hmm. to care for the character. Which leads me to the most difficult question to ask you, but I know you're gonna have an answer for it, is the fact that one of the things that I was blown away by your film is that you do play with the inherent bias of the audience, the expectation that we, we think we know what these characters are going to do. We're biased towards them, but then you turn it around on us. Can you tell us about using that as a, as a, as a narrative? When we were writing and, and we had already the sketch or, or the general idea of, of the journey of Suho and when we were discussing with some colleagues, one of them, um, a friend told us that it was a story of science fiction that a kid with this context could turn his back to violence. And I think that really moved us because it, 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 it landed on us that in, in a country where mothers are going uh, to rural areas with a stick and, and it, it, it's gonna, uh, for, for an audience that it's not familiar with this, it's really shocking. They, they put a stick on the earth, and in the places where it comes out smelling of rotten, it's where a smelling of? of of rot of rotten of rotten. okay it it's where a corpse might be uh, might be hidden might be dumped, so that's what people are doing in Mexico right now. We have all all this association of women traveling throughout the country doing that. So f for us, that's science fiction. It shouldn't be science fiction, the act of a kid wanting to go to school. But uh, in, in, in how things are turning out, the prejudice is so great that we knew we had to use it as a narrative device because uh, otherwise it would land, uh, like our friend said, as a story of science fiction. So the prejudice is on us. Uh, I think it's on us in, in the middle class and it's us as, as, as storytellers, but it's possibly also in the audience. So we try to use that um, to, to give this idea that we are the ones pulling those kids down. In the and end. then on a similar uh, note, um, 
is the fact that you could have done something that was very didactic, almost, you know, cinema verite. Instead, you wrapped it up in this, you know, gorgeous lyrical filmmaking style. You know, tell, tell us about your impetus for, yes, it's a very hard hitting story and it's based on a lot of what is happening right now in Mexico and is telling us something very powerful, but it's, it's done in a very lyrical way, poetic way. Thank you. I think we have two reasons. The first one is that we didn't want to make a spectacle of violence. We wanted to talk about the emotional impact of violence in, in the character. So that's why we decided not to shoot uh, the acts of violence in a frontal way. But also, we wanted to talk about the general experience of growing. And that's not independent of the context of the film, but uh, we wanted to, to be beyond that. To, to talk about this kid who is trying to find his way and his place in the world. And, and that's why we wanted to, to talk more about the, the emotions and the sensations and, and the percep perceptions of, of reality. Well, we can't wait to see what you guys do next. You guys are super talented and it's, a, it's an amazing achievement what you've done. Thank you so much for being here. No, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.